So, can you all hear me? Uh, yeah, good. Okay. Um, just checking that this is okay. Yeah, it is. So, uh, I'm so glad to be here. <clears throat> And it's really awesome to see so many people uh, that come here uh, to like uh, to share experiences on Selenium, uh, and um, and I'm, I've been looking forward to this conference uh, a lot. Uh, as I was sitting down to prepare this talk, uh, I had a bit of a think about what we as a project uh, have achieved uh, over the course of the past year, uh, and and had to dig through my mailing list and so. And believe me, the list is not short. Uh, in just one year, from, from around the time of last year's Selenium conference in San Francisco, we've really taken some giant steps uh, forward. Uh, Selenium 2 was released uh, with WebDriver as the main component. Uh, there's a new Chrome driver, there's a new Android driver uh, for WebKit, there's a, uh, an iPhone driver, uh, and a new driver for Opera, uh, which was announced at this conference last year, and really a lot more. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of consolidation. Uh, our community is growing, and, and more people are interested in the brave new world of WebDriver instead of RC. The water project, I'm, uh, I'm being told, is also planning on moving towards WebDriver in the next version, in version 4. Uh, and um, and we're, we're essentially seeing a lot of different groups come, coming together over the WebDriver product. Um, I'm not sure if you also saw the link that was posted to the developers list last week, uh, but uh, it was essentially a comparison from, from a website called indeed.com uh, showing trends in, in the job market. I think I actually have it here. Um, it's an interesting comparison. Uh, the yellow uh, or the orange line is QTP and the blue one is Selenium. And now this is pretty interesting. Um, um, and it's actually also pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. Not only does it show that the focus on automated testing is increasing overall, but Selenium has, as of January 2012, become the leading browser automation tool out there, at least compared in the job market. And that's at least what the statistics are saying. And I think this is in large thanks to the route we've taken so far, uh, with actively involving the browser vendors and asking the browser vendors to like step up to the plate and, and maintain their own maintain their own uh, implementations of WebDriver. Uh, and on the other side, this also gives us a great appeal uh, out there when, when, uh, uh, when they are involved in putting their name and their stamp on uh, an approval on the implementation, they're also implicit, implicitly vouching for the credibility and quality of, of, of the implementation. Uh, we're also moving towards writing a browser automation standard for the, V3, for the V3C. Uh, which is the first step in ensuring uh, that applications developed for the future uh, on the web will have a cross-browser testing platform, uh, just, like, uh, 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 just like every hip browser now comes with like, a debugger like Firebug or Dragonfly. Um, now I'm sure that Simon is going to cover a lot of this uh, in his uh, talk tomorrow uh, morning, but I'd just like to highlight before, before we get started that the primary reason uh, for for, for the project getting this far and getting where we are now is, is despite all the reasons that I've given so far, uh, the amazing community that we have. And it's really thanks to, to all of you that are here today uh, 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 because this is, that's, far, uh, that's, why, um, that's how far the project has come. Let me just move back to my... Slide here. Yes, there are kittens. So, um, first a bit of introductions. I'm Andreas. Um, I work at Opera in the Oslo office. There are actually quite a few people from, uh, quite a few committers on the Selenium project from Oslo. There's uh, Christian, and I think I saw Yari over there. Uh, so, if you ever come to Oslo, you should be aware that you might actually run into some, some committer on the street. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not that big a city. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, I work at Opera as a tools developer in, in the core department, and I basically make out browse, uh, Opera's browser automation team. Uh, it's, it's a really easy team to keep track of because it's just me. Uh, uh, at least I tell myself that sometimes, uh, although I'm not schizophrenic, and that was a joke. <laughs> um, 
this is my business card. It's, uh, it's a virtual business card. It's written in HTML and CSS, so you can't take it home. And um, uh, the slides are coming there later. Uh, I haven't had time to upload them because I was ninja by Simon to do all sorts of different stuff. Anyways, moving on. I'm actually here uh, to talk about some very serious stuff today. And it concerns really our conceptions of what the web is and who uses the web. This is where we are. The web is probably infinitely bigger than, than, than what anyone could, could, could imagine. Some, some conservative estimations uh, tell us that there are well over 140 million uh, unique domain names out there. And if you count in all the domain names that have been created over the years and deleted, we're reaching a number of up to half a billion domain names. And some estimations say that the internet's size is roughly around, uh, roughly around five million petabytes, no, terabytes, sorry. And it, that's over five million gigabytes and over uh, five trillion megabytes of data. Uh, I believe Eric Schmidt, uh, the former CEO of Google, uh, said, it, said uh, that they, in seven years of existent, existence, hadn't indexed more than 200 terabytes of that. At this, and, 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 and comparatively, that's uh, only 0.004% of the internet. So there's a lot out there we don't know about. And I'm going to uh, shed some light on a small fraction of that today. Um, and as I said, these numbers are really conservative and personally I believe it to be a lot, lot bigger. We're also pro approaching, uh, approaching a situation where more and more services uh, are becoming web-based. Um, um, and I think that there is no longer a clear distinction between what is an internet-based uh, internet service and what is a web-based service. And the web is becoming the de facto interface for, for how you're accessing all sorts of information. Email has already taken a step uh, into the web world uh, quite a few years ago, and uh, you no longer have to use like a mail program to read your email. Uh, instant mes instant mes messaging, we are seeing integrated into services like Facebook and Google Plus. And the thing is, what, what, what do I really mean about an interface? Um, the web is being used as an interface for, for, for email, uh, which you previously needed a program to read. Email as a technology is not going to disappear, uh, but we are seeing new ways of wrapping it in, so, new sorts of, uh, in a new sort of terminal. Uh, we, we, almost have, uh, uh, we almost have everywhere. Uh, I mean, every new device that comes out has, has a browser shift with it, and, and uh, I'm pretty sure that like, TVs and gaming consoles and everything is going to have browsers in them. Uh, quite soon. Um, and the same thing is happening with video music, uh, which you in the old days had to first download and then you had to run a program and uh, to, to listen to it. Uh, same thing with video. Uh, but the old protocols are not disappearing for, well, why should they? They are well designed and they are efficient. There are essentially no reasons why they should be re replaced by anything else. Uh, I. I think there is like an in increasing trend where more services are becoming web-based and where the web is more like uh, uh, an interface for accessing the information on their underlying services. Uh, a lot of so-called experts have been saying recently that email is like outdated and it, that it should be replaced. Uh, but um, uh, uh, there's also the case for archi archiving and, and that. Anyways, I digress. Um, a friend of mine uh, said, says that for an internet protocol to become, to become successful, it needs to fulfill two simple demands. One, it needs to be able to show you pictures of cute, adorable kittens. And secondly, it needs to, the ability to serve pornography. Uh, I'm not going to show you a picture of that. but. Um, now, I'm not entirely sure if, if he's right about that uh, theory, of th theory of his, uh, but, but it's surprising, uh, or, well, maybe not that surprising. Uh, um, there's, well, not a, there's like a surprising correlation uh, between this theory and, and the web as a, as a protocol, uh, or email for that matter. And the web is actually quite popular.
Anyways, in some cases, I would say that the distinction between the browser as a component and the operating system is getting more blurry. Examples of this uh, includes uh, the new Galaxy Nexus, where a lot of the functions on the phone uh, are closely tied to various Google services, like a phone like this, which just came out. Um, you see operating systems like OS X and Windows Azure, or how you pronounce it, uh, uh, Ubuntu Unity, uh, all integrating the web into, into the actual operating system. And you have like uh, other, other parties taking it a lot further, Google OS and, and, um, and uh, Mozilla's boot to Gecko project, which is really interesting. Uh, Santi told me yesterday, I'm not sure if he's here, but he told me yesterday that uh, he had tried the boot to Gecko thing and essentially all the apps that are sitting on, on the device itself are written in, written in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. The phone book, the dialer, the messaging system, everything. And if this is going to be the future, we have a lot to do with the Selenium project. We need to make sure that this system is testable. Overall, I think it's a good development because it means that more people will have access to, to more information uh, through an interface, but it also means, uh, it also means two things. Uh, the web browsers are becoming e increasingly more complex, and two, they are becoming more important components in, in people's lives, and people will rely more on, on these services being well tested and well, uh, well quality assured. Let's go back here. So, um, to the main point of my talk. I said I would challenge your thoughts about web, what web is, and specifically I want to, ch want to challenge you on who you think uses the web, and who your prospective users are. In the world today, there are approximately 7 billion people, uh, more or less. Uh, we actually recently turned 7, million, uh, 7 billion people on the planet, and it's uh, remarkably, remarkably, uh, remar remarkable how quickly we, we reproduce. Uh, how, many, uh, how many would you guess have access to the internet? And not that many. Of those 7 billion people, only a quarter have access to the internet. For uh, the reasons for this are many, uh, Europe in large parts uh, and in large parts the Americas and Asia are agriculturally uh, cultivated lands and all of them have been uh, varying uh, to varying various degrees, uh, went through some sort of period of industrialization. Uh, this is in large thanks to the underlying foundations of nature uh, that has made it possible to cultivate the land of course. Uh, and we should really consider ourselves lucky that we have this internet thing. The Industrial Revolution brought about uh, with it a demand for increased infrastructure, not only in the sense that you needed new roads and that you needed new railways, factories, steam engines and so forth, but also the way that um, you had to organize work to get, to get more work done. And specifically, it demanded new, new, new solutions for communication. As, and as, and uh, if we fast forward a couple of hundred years, this demand has really been ever growing. We are living in the age of the ele uh, electronic revolution, and there is still really no sign of, 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 of when we're going to get to the point of not needing more bandwidth, or not needing more power, or not needing more capacity in some way or another. Now, there are certain parts in the world, uh, certain parts in the world are less fortunate in terms of natural climate, and in certain parts of the world, the history of the internet is, is a completely different one. Whereas most industrial countries in the West have had, albeit expensive, hardwired uh, access to the internet since the early 90s, uh, there are still many places in the world without uh, plain phone lines. So roughly only a quarter of people currently have access to the internet. But an interesting fact is that despite this, about half of all people in the world have access to a mobile phone. Now I'm. Uh, I don't have any specific data on what divides it into smartphones and dumb old-fashioned phones, but the number is still remarkable. Because of the cl uh, climatic con uh, conditions certain part of, in certain parts of the world, it's all, often dis difficult to also build old-fashioned wired telenetworks, like we're used to. Many parts of Southeast Asia are ridden with monsoon seasons and weather soils, which might give in and collapse. The terrain is also often very difficult to navigate and travel through. Large parts of China, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, many former Soviet republics. In the Pacific, you also have the case of thousands and thousands of islands 
um, and half islands, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, and New Guinea. Uh, then additionally, I think there is an equally important argument that there is not, not enough competence to build advanced tele telenetworks efficiently locally. Uh, if you've ever been to uh, remote places in like northern India, uh, you'll note that there are, there's really no organization to the work done on, on, on tele telenetworks lines. Uh, and in some cases, you might, in some places, you might not even have it. And it might look something like this. Uh, I was actually traveling, traveling through a very remote part of, of Nepal a couple of years ago, and uh, this is how every phone line uh, that I've, I saw in this country looked like. And provided there was electricity at all, of course. Because in most of the parts where I traveled, there was no electricity. So people would bring their mobile phones to like the local charger spot and then charge it there. So, so according to the estimations some statistical agencies have done, roughly about 1.3 billion people are already using the mobile internet in some way or another. This is comprised of people who use both landlines and phone, phones and devices, and people who use phones exclusively to access the internet. Uh, now, as you probably know, this is, this is really the problem we've been working at, uh, uh, working at, uh, at Opera for the last 15 years or so. Uh, how are we going to get from 1.3 million to 2, 2, 2 billion or 2.3 billion? Uh, one of the core ideas behind Opera is to ship, uh, ship the browser to as many small web devices as possible, and, and uh, preferably also to like old uh, deprecated phone systems, so that more, more and more people can, can get access to, access to the internet, and also enjoy the same internet experience as, as a regular user would. And this brings along really a lot of a lot of um, um, uh, a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, I need to talk a little bit about uh, about what we do at Opera uh, to illustrate my point. Uh, it's not really product placement, but uh, I hope you bear with me. Uh, so we ship a number of different products. Uh, I mean, the one that's most known is probably the desktop browser. Uh, we ship that for uh, for um, for the regular operating systems like OS X, Linux, Windows, and BSD, I think. And um, this is the only product from Opera which is supported out of the box from the Opera driver, currently. Then we have a product called uh, Opera Mobile, which is essentially the same thing as as the desktop browser, uh, only that the Chrome and the UI is is different. It also has a feature called uh, Opera Turbo, which uh, it, it, it kind of uh, it connects to a proxy server. The proxy server brings down pages, and then we cache that and send it off to off to the device again. And uh, this product is virtually shipped for for any kind of phone and any kind of tablet. But apart from the UI, it's it's pretty much identical with with the desktop browser. We also ship. Uh, uh, ship Opera for TVs. Um, we ship uh, what's called uh, a software development kit or an, kit or an SDK, uh, which various TV manufacturers use to customize uh, and personalize the browsing ex experience on, on TVs. And these run on all kinds of different architectures, everything from MIPS to, to, uh, to ARM and uh, PowerPC, actually. Uh, so Basically, we're trying to put the internet into any device imaginable, but since typically TV manufacturers aren't interested in making their own browsers, we provide uh, sort of the browser component for them. So it's easier to get them hooked up to the internet. Now, finally, we also ship uh, a product called Opera Mini. And uh, this is a really, really interesting product. It's, uh, it's very different from any product, product that we've been working on before. And actually, this is not a real browser. It's, it's just like a, a stupid client, a dumb client sitting on, sitting on your phone. Uh, when you go to a web page uh, to request data, to request a website, it gets, uh, it gets, uh, the data gets sent off to one of our data centers. Uh, the data center pulls down the web page and actually compiles all of, all of the stuff into a binary file and just sends it off to the client, um, to your phone. And so, so 
the downside to this is that you, 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 you don't have stuff like uh, a JavaScript runtime running on your phone, uh, because that's running on the server side. And the really good thing about, about this, uh, uh, this sort of approach to our products is that, uh, is that it saves, saves so much time when, 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 we're, uh, when we want to test these products and we, when, when we want to maintain them. Uh, because uh, essentially, uh, it's the same opera sitting inside of all of these products, and it's just like different wrapping around it. And uh, there's literally no hassle in getting uh, this dumb mini client working on a 10-year-old phone. And that's really uh, a good thing if, if, if your market is, uh, is places where, uh, uh, where the general phones are quite old. So, um, this looks, oh, it's shaking. Interesting. So, uh, the World Wide Web. Uh, we all know it and we all use it. And it's really not uh, a Western world, rich, rich world thing anymore. Um, and the internet as we know it is, is changing and it's changing really fast. Uh, a lot of people in this world have phones. Uh, many more have phones than have computers. Uh, a, lot more people, a lot of people don't even have the power to run their own computers, but they have phones. And as I said, we put the web into any kind of phone. Uh, we're in hundreds and hundreds of different handsets, uh, reaching millions of people who would never otherwise have internet access at all. Uh, and the interesting thing about, about our service is that because they go through our, serv our service, we, which are located in like strategic places around the world, uh, we also know a lot of statistics about who uses it and, and uh, uh, what people are in different parts of the world are interested in. And, uh, what people are, are interested in, in, in using. Um, for the mini product, we, we, we have about 160 million active users. So, so in, terms of, in terms of market share, it's, it's quite big there. It's not so big in like, the Western world. Uh, and this is partly because of like, the, um, 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 the goal that we have set to, to, to bring internet to, to, to places where internet is, isn't available already. Um, yeah, I have this, uh, I have this um, statistics which are compiled from, uh, from, uh, from logs from, yeah, this is a couple of months old I think, about six months or so. Uh, but it's interesting and it shows uh, countries uh, using uh, Opera Turbo and Opera Mini. Uh, and the two top countries using these kind of products are Russia and Indonesia. Um, but uh, it gets even more interesting if we dig a bit down in these statistics. Uh, the world's top 20 sites based on the number of unique users. If we look at the list of the world's top 20 websites according to the statistics that we have for, for our product, I mean it's obviously going to be different for, for other products, uh, the story is one that is very different from that of the desktop browser market, where you wouldn't expect to find sites like Yandex and Mail.ru, um, because there's a high market share in Russia, basically. But what, I want, but, but what I wanted to show you here is that there is not really that much of a difference in browsing trends wherever in the world you are. There might be a lean towards a preferred alternative to some Western service like uh, in Brazil, they might not be using Facebook, they might be using Orkut or something instead. Uh, but mostly it's the same stuff. It's mail, it's news, and it's social sites. And this proves that the, the, the interest around the world is not different. People want the same thing. If we, if we dig uh, further down into the statistics and look at, uh, look at Indonesia, we have the top 10 sites visited in Indonesia and the top handsets used. Um, we can see that uh, the sites people want to visit are mostly the same. Translated into, into techie speak, uh, people want the same websites to work on whichever browser they're using and wherever they are. 
The list to the right here uh, are the most prop, uh, popular handsets used in Indonesia, and frankly, Nokia seems to have like kind of a monopoly on 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 the, on the, the phone market in Indonesia. If we move to an entirely different part of the world, to the to the US, uh, if you look at the top sites, it's actually mostly the same things. Um, but the story is quite is very different for uh, when you, when it gets to what kind of devices are being used for accessing the internet. We're seeing the iPhone on the top here, uh, many different variations of the BlackBerry, uh, and a couple of Android phones, uh, quite old ones. It looks like in this statistic, but it's a it's a few months old. Um, so in this case, we see uh, generally more powerful hardware with better specs, uh, but still, if we look at have a look at the list of the top sites, it's mostly the same. Uh, people want the same content, and the web has never been about how fast your phone run, runs, really. I mean, it's, it's about getting the content there. Now, returning, uh, uh, returning for a moment to, to what I was talking about earlier, uh, something that is actually uh, uh, quite close to my heart, and which should be like a prime concern for, for anyone building the web, is web standards. Uh, at Opera, we care deeply about the web, uh, and one of the requirements for caring deeply about the web is uh, to also care about the web's design and the definitions of, of, of the web, about standards, in short. Uh, this is also one of the reasons we're delighted to join Mozilla and, and Google. Uh, I can't remember if Adobe joined uh, for the WebDriver V3C specification. Uh, and basically, there there are there are so many so many reasons for caring about the web, and one of them is because it's going to be around for a very very long time. My uh, my boss at Opera, uh, Håkon, who incidentally invented CSS uh, at CERN a couple of years ago, almost half a decade now, uh, he made a prediction a couple of years ago that uh, the web itself is going to be around for roughly 500 years. Uh, and um, that was his prediction, approximately 500 years, sorry. Now, that was back in 2010, so I guess we're looking about 498 years or something uh, now, uh, left of what we consider the internet. And um, you might say that 498 years is a very arbitrary number, but it's not completely random. Uh, this guy, uh, Gutenberg, 500 years ago in Europe, he invented the printing press. And that totally changed the way information was distributed in, in Europe. And it made uh, the Renaissance possible, uh, the Reformation, and the Industrial Revolution. It's essentially, well, it's essentially a brilliant example of, of how, how access to information can change societies. And, um, and his argument was that, and Hawkins' argument was that he believes that the web can do the same thing. And the mora morale is, anyhow, uh, that if we had one of Gu uh, Gutenberg's Bible Bibles here today, uh, we would still know how to use it, because the specification for a Bible is pretty straightforward. We know how to s turn the pages. There's, there's like an open specification for it. There's nothing that is hidden from us. Um, <laughs> And, well, yeah, essentially the, the same principle can be applied to the web. Um, because we need the web to remain open for the next 500 years, uh, and we need it to be accessible on all, on, on all kinds of different devices for the next 500 years. And <laughs> if you think about it, that's kind of a daunting task for a project like Selenium, which already maintains like a huge matrix of, of different browsers. Uh, so luckily I'm not planning to stay around for 500 years to maintain all of this. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but supporting legacy browsers is also like a big part of, of ensuring that uh, uh, used legacy browsers in, in that case is also a big part of ensuring that, uh, ensuring that people, have, uh, people have access to the information there. So um, I, am, I was actually going to, to show you I was going to show you a, uh, a demo on, on an actual device because I've made this implementation. I'm, well, I'm the maintainer of OperaDriver. 
And I've recently started working on uh, getting it supported on, on Opera Mobile. Um, and um, while it's essentially the same product, uh, and the, the, good thing about, the good thing about how Opera is implemented, and it, this differs from the other web driver implementations, like for the Chrome driver, you need to have like an uh, executable uh, sitting next to, next to Chrome. Uh, you don't have to. You, you, you don't have that for Opera because the uh, the actual debug protocol is sitting inside of the browser itself. So, uh, in terms of maintenance costs for for like adding new 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 bindings and new new implementations for for various Opera products, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can you get a scope service, which is the protocol that we're using, uh, pretty much for free. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to like add the sugar around. Um, yeah, essentially there's no proxy between web driver and, and the browser. And uh, the target for the Opera Mobile driver project that I'm working on is, uh, is Android 4, uh, Ice Cream Sandwich, although there might be a possibility that it works on, on earlier devices. Uh, the code hasn't landed in, in the tree yet, uh, and it is not in a version yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll get it in there by, by a month or so. So, uh, so the stuff that I show you here will be available pretty soon. Um, and the cool thing is that the cool thing is that because of because of the way that Opera is is, is made, uh, it makes it makes it really easy to run on, on on different different platforms. So we can we can run it on we can run the tests on the device itself. Uh, we can run it inside of. Uh, uh, program we've made, which which we've called the Opera Mobile Emulator, which is which is essentially a standalone pro, uh, program sitting on your desktop computer, much like a regular browser, and you can you can potentially also use the Android Emulator. I'm not sure how many of you, of you have used the Android Android Emulator, em, em, emulator but uh, I've heard rumors that it's quite unstable. Uh, so I really recommend running tests on actual devices. Now, as I was saying, I was actually planning to do a test on on device uh, because it well it works, but there's something funny about the uh, the wireless network here, so uh, I'm not able to show you that. <laughs> but I am able to show you uh, a demo of uh, Opera Mobile uh, running uh, running Selenium tests. Now it's not a hundred percent of stability. Uh, so don't expect wonders. But uh, in terms of mobile testing, uh, uh, I think this is going to be like a, a, a pleasant, uh, a pleasant introduction. Uh, I have the Selenium tests sitting here. Uh, so I've set my my pa the path to Opera uh, to just be the path to my Opera mobile emulator, essentially, uh, just like I would set the path to a regular Opera uh, binary, and I do go. Uh, for the Opera test run, and we'll see what happens. It's setting stuff up. This is not the Opera driver. It's uh, the Opera test set. It's the test setup, and hopefully soon we'll get an emulator. Yeah, so there we go. This is running in mobile. So these are the Selenium tests running in, in Opera Mobile, and uh, I hope you noticed the speed uh, because, uh, compared to a lot of uh, a lot of the emulators I've been uh, been looking at, this is pretty awesome. And um, the point I'm the, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, testing on uh, testing on, on mobile devices is really so important if if you want to support uh, the entire web. So. Um, Uh, the, Opera, the Opera driver itself, uh, which I introduced at this conference about a little over a year ago, um, is largely actually a result of scratching our, our, our own itch uh, at Opera. Around 2008, we, has, we essentially had come to a point in, in testing the browser itself where, where, we had, uh, where we had tests that did not suffice. Um, they didn't cover everything. We basically found out that if we want to get further in testing the browser, we need a library for being able to click links and enter text into the browser to see if it crashes or something. And uh, we had all sorts of different te uh, tests before that. We, have we had JavaScript tests, we had visual tests, we had reference tests, memory tests, performance tests, all kinds of different stuff. 
but we were really missing the, uh, the ability to like uh, 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 click buttons and, and interact uh, with the browser in the same way as a user would emulate the user. Now, I, I said that it's not perfect, but it's, if you look at the results, it's still pretty good. So it will be pristine when it, whenever it gets out. So, um, yeah, so uh, essentially Opera Driver went from being a tool that we used inside to, to, to something that we said, hey, this is useful, uh, and we had implemented this using the web driver interface, so why don't we share it with everyone? And, and uh, it, it, it turned out for, 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 um, uh, for, uh, for, our, for our part to be a very welcoming, uh, a well, very welcoming thing, because it, for, for us as a browser vendor, it was, this was kind of like a double victory. Uh, on, on one side, we were able to, we were able to emulate uh, input, which triggered the exact same code paths, as a user would when, when, when interacting with the browser. Uh, and, but, on, but on the other side, uh, we were also enabling website makers, uh, website developers, uh, to test in Opera, which for us as a browser vendor means that we get a better site compatibility for free, essentially. Uh, and that is quite possibly uh, like getting this deployed on, on major websites and, and get, making sure that we have, uh, that we have uh, coverage uh, for, for, for bigger websites is like one of the primary, primary um, site compatibility gains uh, of this last year, maybe next to our HTML5 uh, parser that was released earlier this year. So uh, Opera was founded with with, uh, with um, one single goal in mind, and that was uh, how we could provide the best internet experience uh, on any kind of device. Uh, and the idea behind this is, is actually a really, de it's, it's, it's a very democratic uh, idea. We, we deeply believe that having access to the web and enabling people to participate uh, uh, is going to bring around, bring around change, uh, which is going to change the world for the better. And the internet is such a cool thing, so we can't let people miss out on it. And the reason why, why, uh, why you should also consider uh, using this uh, Opera mobile device for, for, for your testing, and it's really, really easy to set up. Uh, there's going to be like plain introductions and tutorials for this when it gets out in a month's time, um, is because it's such a huge market share. And uh, if you look at the browser market shares uh, that are out there, uh, 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 Opera is, is, is the leading browser, and uh, especially in, in, in parts of the world where, where um, internet connectivity is bad. So if you want to make sure that your website reaches everyone and is, is uh, accessible from any kind of, any kind of device, it's, uh, it's really uh, a cool thing to use. Just like an example, I could do start the Opera mobile emulator. And uh, here I get a list of various devices that I, I want to emulate. So I could, for say, uh, could say, I want to emulate a Samsung Galaxy S, and I'll get a Galaxy Samsung S with like, the, the features of, of that, uh, that device. But I could also say, hmm, maybe I want to emulate a um, uh, Nokia C7-00. God knows what that is. And I'll get uh, an emulator resembling that. Uh, correspondingly, this was a phone, uh, phone emulator. I could also do uh, a, like a tablet UI for this. <clears throat> so you'll notice that the UI here is, is kind of different. You'll have the bar on the top. And this, uh, this also has a different resolution. So testing your websites also on different resolutions is also, going, is also important in, in, in the process of making sure that your website is, is accessible. And um, yeah, uh, with this in mind, uh, essentially, uh, we, we, uh, we hope that we uh, will be able to make a little bulk in the internet and get more people online. So if you want to make uh, sure that your websites are reachable and 
that uh, uh, more people essentially get access to the internet, which is, I think, a really important case. Uh, please consider also testing on, testing on Opera because you will get so much for free when it comes to mobile testing. So uh, I hope you'll start using this and I'll make sure that I send out a message on, on the users list whenever the mobile, uh, mobile uh, stuff is in the repo and is in a Selenium version. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, you can come and talk to me later. Uh, I'll be around and it was really nice talking to you. Thank you.